Right, so good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm uh, delighted to welcome you to um, webinar number 21 in the series of 2021, uh, or 21 for 2021. Um, we're actually going to be doing 22 in the whole series because there's another one coming up in a, in a, in a, a couple of weeks' time. So um, I'm delighted to welcome David Mitchell. David Mitchell works for Two Health. Um, he's business development manager and Two Health um, provides services for people with uh, disability for work and education. Um, David tells me he's been in the um, uh, uh, business for about 20 years or so. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to David and he's going to be talking to us about um, diversity and inclusion. Thank you, David. Thanks, Neil. Could you enable me to share, please? Oh, I will indeed. Bear with me one second. How remiss of me. I've just realised that. <laughs> ah, right. Yes, I can do that over there. There we go. Over to you, David. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for uh, attending. I'm going to start with a presentation, um, hopefully not death by PowerPoint, um, on this uh, nice Thursday evening. Um, and then basically I will actually be flicking out of the presentation and looking at a bit of software, hopefully we'll, if we've got the time. Um, but at any time, um, do answer, you know do put questions in the side, as Neil said. Um, anything kind of urgent, then we'll we'll try and jump in and answer as we go through. Um, so yeah, basically my, my name is David Mitchell. I've um, been in the industry for quite a long time. Um, Two, two kind of things. One, one is that um, I've dealt with a lot of different kind of um, disabilities support in, in different solutions such as training, um, such as um, you know delivering equipment even, um, setup of ergonomics right through to um, kind of operations manager in my last role. Um, so quite a diverse role. Um, there isn't pretty much anything I don't know about assistive technology. Um, I'm dyslexic myself, found out 10 years ago um, and I think my strengths are that I remember things about assistive technology so it's quite lucky um, but it's also IT as well I'm quite quite a nerd really um, so that's kind of a little bit more on, on myself um, we've just done a little bit on housekeeping uh, thanks to Neil um, one thing to remind you guys I'm going to leave my camera on so you can lip read if you need to um, I'm slightly hard of hearing so I do lip read as well as um, you know actually watching presentations but you can actually switch on your own captions um, within the actual menu that will only appear on your screen um, it won't affect the recording and so the little image there on the left shows you how you can do that um, and just a quick kind of agenda of what we're going to cover quite a lot actually in the time we've got and um, hopefully we'll uh, keep it to time um, so we're going to cover characteristics of um, neurodiverse conditions. I won't go too in depth, um, just give you a bit of an overview for people who may not know. Um, and then we're going to go into the areas of strengths on those um, characteristics of those different neurodiverse conditions, um, which we find is very, very key because uh, we're not trying to point at people's failures. It's more how we can um, assist people with um, conditions, but then actually utilize their strengths, you know, enhance them and utilize them within workplace or education. Um, but I've got a couple of samples um, of occupational health involvement. Um, try to come up with a couple of scenarios without naming real people, but where we've actually um, seen this happens a lot. Um, so I've come up with a couple of scenarios, um, quite basic and brief really. Uh, and then I'm going to show you these exciting stuff, which is the reasonable adjustment solutions. Um, we're going to jump into a bit of software. Um, I'm going to actually demonstrate Dragon today if I can get around to doing that. And hopefully it won't put swear words in this time because it's done that before for me. Um, and then also I'm going to show MindView, which is a mind mapping software. Um, and then I'm going to cover a little bit on funding. Um, funding is available from the government, so we'll go into that a little bit. Um, and then further on, um, any services that we can provide um, part of Two Health. Uh, and then we'll do a quick Q&A. Um, so basically, uh, terminology of neurodiversity. So um, as an umbrella term, uh, basically it falls under different things. So you'll hear different things about um, it being referred to. So neurodiverse, uh, neurodivergent. Um, one that I don't like is neurominorities. I don't feel I'm a minority um, because there's around 15% of people in workplace will have uh, a hidden 
uh, disability. So uh, it tends to be um, hidden because people won't disclose it or they don't even realise they've got it, which I did myself until like 10 years ago. Um, and then you begin to realise you've had your own coping strategies and that's why you were the way you were growing up and going through education and stuff. Um, so often it's, it's hidden. Um, SPLD is a terminology still used, um, but it's more in the education sector. Um, it does filter over into workplace, so you know a lot of people do mention SPLD. Uh, I believe we've even got it in our back office system. So um, yeah, SPLD you know, basically goes into the remit of uh, neurodiverse conditions. Um, so here are the ones that um, we're going to be kind of covering today. Um, so a little bit on the traits uh, of these people, these, these conditions, should I say. Um, so everybody knows about autistic um, spectrum conditions. Um, somebody will know somebody who's got autism. Um, my nephew's autistic, my son-in-law's autistic. Um, so it, it's, you know, it's out there and everybody's known of the old films and it's, it's brought into you know, me, social media and media very, very much these days. Um, so a little bit on that is communication interaction issues. Um, it used to be thought that they would be um, have no empathy, but that's been found out that that isn't true. They actually do have empathy, just a different kind. It's a different way they think. Um, and basically the way they interpret it, interpret it things. So you might say things literally and they will take it literal, like it's raining cats and dogs. They'll look outside for cats and dogs falling out of the sky. Um, very sensitive to stimuli, such things as loud noise. Um, flashing lights, things that can be quite scary if you're not expecting it. Um, so yeah, they can be quite sensitive to those and it can cause a reaction. Maybe you know, they've got a coping strategy like tickings and things like that, or even shouting and panicking. Um, moving on to dyslexia. Um, so this is kind of my room because I'm dyslexic, but um, there are loads of different kind of variations of dyslexia. Um, you can have traits of dyslexia right through to uh, quite severe. Um, I struggle with reading and writing, um, really open to that. I asked loads of people to double check my work, such as Janet even. Um, and then basically uh, there is technology that can support that, you know. Um, working memory, uh, I have a terrible short term memory, forget people's names, uh, forget the last things that was said to me. Uh, but on my long term memory, once I've got that into my memory bank, it stays there and I can recite things quite in depth really. Um, so there are advantages as well as the disadvantages there. Um, and processing information. Um, sometimes I'll listen to sentences and not take it in the right way, or I'll even write sentences and it needs moving around to actually make sense. Um, ADHD or ADD, so Attention Deficit Disorder or Hyperactive Disorder, um, is basically, it will have traits of the others, but um, it's more about um, being easily distracted, um, having loads of different things on your mind at the same time. Um, so not thinking about this, you know the things you should, should be easily going over to other things. Um, and I'll go into why they're covering each other in a moment. Um, dyscalculia, um, one that's not often heard of much, around three to five percent of people have dyscalculia. Um, similar traits to dyslexia with the memory and reading and writing issues, um, but it's more with um, issues with money and issues with numbers, issues with figures, issues, you know, pretty much anything where it involves those kind of things. Um, so even just directions in a day, you, you often find that they could be late because they struggle with directions, struggle with times, timetables for buses or trains, those kind of things. So everyday things come into um, issues that they would you know, have to cope with. Um, dyspraxia uh, is the motor coordination um, disability. Um, I'm slightly dyspraxic. Um, and what it means, it tends to be uh, bad motor co coordination, um, tend to bump into things, knock things over, feeling quite clumsy, appear to be clumsy, often have bruises where they're banging into edges of tables, into doors when they're not opening them the whole way. So the perception is not great. Often breaking you know, the mobile connections in a phone because they're, they're jamming it in because they can't quite guide it in easily. So the, the traits are there and um, you know, can be quite uh, frustrating for them and get very anxious and, and quite upset. Um, the reason they're overlapping each other is these um, kind of neurodiverse conditions will have traits of the other disabilities in them, not necessarily the ones they're next to at the moment. So for me, dyslexia, um, I'm dyslexic, but I also have a little bit of ADHD. So I've got to make sure all my phones are uh, you know, hidden away from a minute right now, making sure I'm not being distracted. I can listen to a conversation and start to think about something that I was doing before the conversation, and I miss the conversation because I'm literally living out what I was thinking. 
and then I come back to the conversation and think, oh my God, I missed that. Um, so that's you know the kind of things where I'll struggle. Um, and I think I'm a little bit dyspraxic. Again, it could be I could be you know, a little bit discalculated, but I'm not really. I'm quite good at numbers. Um, so yeah, they do have traits. So uh, the reason I'm mentioning that is you can't keyhole one person with a disability. There's dyslexia, there's your solution, you're sorted. They're going to have traits of other disabilities. They're going to have their own personalities. They're going to have their own job roles. So each person does need looking at in different ways. Um, and then the strengths. So basically talking about the strengths of um, these conditions. Now, these are all basically strengths that we put in this image that basically cover all of the disabilities. Some will be for different ones. Um, so <coughs> verbally well, so I do actually get on well. I don't get as nervous in conversations, very outspoken, love you know talking in groups. Um, love being a uh, centre of attention, believe it or not. Um, and, and things like basically, I can think outside the box. I can view um, a task that you're trying to achieve or a project, and I can view what the outcome would look like in a visual 3D form. And I can look then straight away and think, well, actually this could go wrong on the way to that, and this could go wrong, and other people can't view that the same way. Um, so there's loads of different kind of um, solutions like my long-term memory. Um, I'm a great problem solver. Fantastic doing things with my hands, um, even just like um, if I think about you know fixing something, I can visualize that in my mind and know how I've got to fix it. I can draw that down and actually fix it straight away without going off and finding out how to do that. So there's loads and loads of strengths that these you know conditions have um, that can actually be tapped into and make them great employees. So it's key that we you know enhance them and use those um, conditions. OK, so a couple of examples. Um, I did quickly knock these up to make sure that they, they're in there for um, occupational health. So um, do forgive me if they're a little bit basic, um, but they are condition, they are um, examples that we've gone through um, with companies and employees. So here we've got Alicia. She's been placed on a performance review. Um, she mentions then that she's basically got a neurodiverse condition and it's ADHD. OK. So. <clears throat> Her manager assumes it's simply a ploy because she's obviously not got, doing good at her job um, and she's just trying to get away with it, but he reports it to Occupational Health for review. And then Occupational Health um, advise Alicia, uh, we think you need to go for a workplace needs assessment to um, you know, ensure that we can put reasonable adjustments in place for you. Um, and then basically our recommendations are assistive technology, um, training to use that technology, which is quite key. I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, coaching on the job, which is different than, than training. It's how to cope and actually achieve the task of your job role with your conditions. Um, and then manager awareness training. So that's training for her manager on her condition. OK. So all of these um, are being put in place. However, um, as the adjustments are put in place, the manager decides I've not got time for this. I mean, you know, I've got a heavy, heavy job role. Um, I don't have time for this, so um, I'm actually going to miss that training. She's got everything else put in place, so you know, we'll be okay. Um, the issues with that scenario then, and what would happen? Um, basically, he won't understand her needs. He won't know um, the way she behaves and the coping strategies that she's been given. Um, so he won't be able to actually support her in the way that he should do. Um, he probably expect her to be able to get on with everything um, and not be not you know need the extra support from him, um, which would be completely wrong. Um, and then basically from the back of that, at least she's basically going to get insecure. She's going to feel anxiety. She's going to feel that her manager doesn't care, and basically you know could even end up on on the sick from it from stress and anxiety and things. So it's not a really good situation. Um, so basically. Alicia's manager didn't um, put all of the adjustments in place. He should have done um, by not refusing the training. Um, should occupational health have actually followed this and made sure that he's actually putting it in place and attending the training? Um, I think the, the manager should have somebody telling him whether it's occupational health within your business or whether it's you know, the manager of the manager, so more senior manager. These, these systems have to be put in place and need to be followed. Otherwise, you could end up in a tribunal and that's the last thing you want to be is in a tribunal with somebody. Um, so basically, um, the key thing really um, on this situation is awareness. Um, having awareness in place beforehand, being proactive, um, Alicia should have disclosed earlier that she's got a condition, 
But like I said earlier, often people don't even know they've got a condition and they're finding it out later in life. Um, so she may have found out why am I struggling work, found out privately and then came into work and said, no, I've got this condition now and it's already escalated. So not often do they disclose or they feel like they're going to be um, discriminated against and might not be able to progress in work or even get a job. Um, so that awareness for the business should have been there. The manager should have been aware of conditions so he could have found out earlier as well. Maybe he could have seen the traits that she's um, showing. She's struggling with certain things. She could be, you know, attention deficit disorder or you know, dyslexia, that kind of thing. So he could have pointed out the support needs um, happening before he starts to progress her, um, her, her disciplinary. OK, so example two. We've got George, um, he's in, in a hands-on role, he's really good at his job and he's performed so well that his manager's put him forward for a promotion. He gets the promotion into a manager position, um, but then uh, the manager isn't happy with his performance as that manager because um, he's not doing as good as he was in his previous role. So when he was in a hands-on role, he was great. Now he's moved into the role of this position. He's not so good. So. What should have happened really? The manager um, has gone and had a one-to-one -one with George. Um, he states that he's basically no better um, and basically George needs to um, go back to the role he was in the last um, position. Um, <clears throat> from the back of that, he, he then reports um, off a complaint that he's um, stating that he's dyslexic and he feels like he's not being supported, so he actually puts in a formal complaint. And then basically what should happen is um, managers should refer George to occupational health for support um, at that point. Occupational health should refer George, refer George um, for a reasonable adjustment. Um, so basically a workplace needs assessment for reasonable adjustments. Um, and the adjustment should include awareness training um, called coaching. And this will enjoy, enable George to work better with the manager and the manager better with George. And it gives the manager more of an awareness. So again, it's more on a awareness um, where these things are happening. So we need to be more proactive as well as reactive rather than reacting when things are going wrong. Let's get that awareness out there to managers that, um, you know, these conditions that are out there and this is the support that you need to be putting in place. OK, so scenario is over. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit on um, workplace needs um, assessment adjustments. Um, so what might be recommended out of the um, back of having a workplace needs assessment? So for the people who don't know what a workplace needs assessment is, it's where you um, have an assessment of the needs of your disability to complete your role in work, not to make you better than anybody else. It's to enable you to do your duties in, in your job. OK, so it can it basically involve anything from assistive technology solutions, which we're going to cover a little bit in, a, in our session. It could involve then training on that assistive technology. That's quite key, really, um, and I'll go into that later as well. Uh, workplace strategies. So workplace strategies could be pretty much things like changing the font of documents that you're producing. It's all the dyslexic friendly. It could be changing the environment the person's working in. So if they're um, ADHD, Maybe you know they've got a distraction. They're sat near a walkway, or you know near the entrance to you know the canteen, and that's a distraction. Or they're sat near a window, um, or there's loud noises around them. Maybe they just need a headset to be able to work and concentrate. So little things can be very low cost um, adjustments as well. Coaching and core coaching I mentioned in the scenarios. So coaching somebody on how to do their job role with the kind of dis dif difficulties. So it could be um, preparing for a meeting preparing for exiting a meeting. The core coaching would be the manager then preparing uh, to give meeting notes to the person who's going in so they know what to expect. So it's not a shock when they get in there, uh, but also following up with verbal and written information. So there's lots of little things that they can do for the coaching that will really help both parties and basically help the person to get on with, uh, with the job role. Um, and then there's awareness training. So often on the back of a workplace needs assessment, the department might need awareness training. So they're working now with somebody who may be ADHD or, or autistic or dyslexic, and they've no idea how to react or support that person. So the best way is to get the team awareness trained. And I'll go into how funding is actually covering things like that later. Um, and then additionally, there's things like travel, and, and there are some other things that can be recommended, but one of the um, key ones is travel because it's quite an expensive um, thing. Um, somebody might be, you know, needing travel solutions when they're having a workplace needs assessment because they struggle to get to work. And I'll, I'll go into that a little bit later. 
OK, so we're going to do the exciting part now. I'm actually going to come out of the presentation and do a demonstration of Dragon. I'll explain what it is before I do. Um, Dragon, naturally speaking, is basically um, a speech to text product, a bit like when we speak to Alexa, it does commands. Dragon does the same, but Dragon can write for us as well, so it can dictate text. Um, it can actually command the whole computer with your voice. OK, so we can actually manipulate the computer, move around and give it commands and it will do everything just by us speaking. So somebody physically impaired could actually run a full computer. The only thing they can't do is switch it on. There's that much Dragon can do pretty much anything. If it doesn't work with back office systems, you then implement uh, what's called scripting. So you can actually script it to do things. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit with using some commands. Um, and I'll do a little bit of scripting. Um, I'll not go too in depth because it can. I'm actually using a webcam microphone. It's not the best. It's better with a headset where it's nearer to my mouth. Um, but yeah, we'll uh, we'll quickly switch out of um, the presentation there, and I'll share Microsoft Word because that's what I'm going to use Dragon with. Now, <clears throat> I can't actually show you me opening at Word because I've got to share it. Um, but basically, I would have normally have said open Word and it will actually open the program for me. OK, um, the program sat there waiting for me to command it to actually open up. It's been waiting for me since we started. Um, so I'm going to start the commands and do a little bit of a demo for you now. Uh, wake up. This is a demonstration using Dragon Naturally Speaking. Full stop, new line. It seems to be working pretty well today considering it's gone 8 p.m. Scratch that. OK, go to sleep. So all it did there is it misheard me and came up with another command. There's a bit of feedback going on. Um, but I'll, I'll do a different command now and, and show you how we can make corrections with our voice. Uh, wake up. Select Dragon Naturally Speaking. Go to sleep. OK, so I just wanted to quickly show you this. So this is a, a correction menu that you get when you're actually using Dragon. So in here, I can actually choose spell that. So I can actually spell it out because I think it's spelt wrong. So if it's say somebody's name and it's put it in wrong, I can spell it out. It then learns the, the way I've said that word and knows how to put it in next time. So the next time I say the word, it as I was automatically learned it. Um, what I can do is choose one, so I can literally say choose one and it would actually make it all caps. Um, so if, if it was a spelling mistake, there would be loads of different words and I could choose one of the different words. Um, but I can do commands like all caps that, unselect that, I can do italicize that, copy that, paste that, that kind of thing. So I can pretty much command that as, as you would in Word, anything. Now if I switch to Microsoft Outlook, the commands change to Outlook commands, things like uh, new email, um, open email, uh, read email from David. All of those commands are different commands than will be in Word. So it switches the commands and knows which ones it should be in. Um, a few other things what it does is it learns from the contents of your writing. So as you're saying a sentence, if it gets the word wrong, it'll automatically correct it by knowing what should be in that sentence. So um, if I was saying something like, um, today I would like an ice cream, it would actually write today I would like an ice cream as in the ice cream. Wherever I said um, somebody scared me and I screamed, it would write correctly I screamed rather than ice cream as in I'm having an ice cream. Um, so it knows from the contents of the sentence what it should be writing. So it's very, very clever. Um, so I'm going to just do a little bit more demonstration um, and show you a little command that I've got in there as well. Wake up. Unselect that. Move to end of document. Move to end of document. New paragraph. Smiley face. New, new line. Pound sign. Euro sign. Select all. Copy that. Unselect. Move to end of document. Scratch that. New line. Paste that. New line. My address. 
go to sleep. Now, that's not my home address, obviously. <laughs> I didn't want to be giving that away, but uh, yeah, I put a command in there, so I've already rewritten this command, and it knows when I say my address to actually put that in for me. So if I was form filling, I could have loads of the information that would I would normally put in and bang that in really, really quickly just using a command because I've already pre-done that. And that can save time. So somebody in a medical um, kind of job role can be really filling in forms very quickly. Um, or if you are doing Excel even, you could do Excel numbers very, very quickly. Um, or you can do it for abbreviations. So if, say, you wanted to have every time I say um, NHS to type National Health Service, you can add that in this command and it will always do it for you. OK, um, so there's lots and lots of different things you can do with it. Um, I can search the Internet. I can basically um, move around into different documents and switch between Excel, Word, Outlook, all with my voice. So quite, quite a powerful tool. OK, so that's Dragon Nationally Speaking. I'm going to turn that off. David, you've gone silent. Getting there. We're probably waiting for Dragon to um, stop using the microphone. No, sadly not. It might be worth leaving and rejoining, perhaps. Sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. Sorry about this, guys. Technicalities and pitches. Yeah. Here comes David. Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, remind me never to turn Dragon off. <laughs> okay, so we'll pop back to the um, presentation. Okay, so um, the product here is called a LiveScribe pen. I've actually physically got one um, here. Uh, that I use. Um, the idea of this pen, and it's literally the size of a pen, um, is you use it with special paper that's got loads and loads of tiny little dots that you can't see. Um, what it does is it actually records audio while you're writing, and then you can actually click onto your writing and it plays the audio back what was being said at the time. So if you're in a meeting and you struggle taking notes and you're, you know, you're struggling to get the information down, I often start notes and then, you know, I'm not quite catching up with them and then I'll, I'll do it as shorthand and by the time I've come out of the meeting, I can't understand what I've, you know, been written and I, I can't refer back to it. Where with this, I can click on the writing and hear back what was being said. So I could shorthand it and then know exactly what was still being said in a meeting and I can then add that additionally later. OK, so there's some more funky things that it does. Um, it will actually then um, transfer straight into an app on your phone. And you can convert your handwriting straight to text. So it'll actually convert it into text and then you can use that text. So it's basically doing your notes for you. Um, and then you can send that to yourself, to your computer. Uh, you can select any images and say, I want them as images. So they'll stay there. So your little doodles, as you can see in this one, it could be a graph that you've written down. Um, that information can come over as a picture. Uh, but some other things that it can do is you can actually write a web address and it creates a web link when it goes into your document. Uh, you can write somebody's home address and it will do a map link to that home address. Or you could do something like um, write an appointment and it will put that appointment in your calendar when you've transferred it. So it's really, really clever on what it can do. Um, so yeah, the idea is um, this will record audio. The audio actually records into the app. So you do need a phone with yourself or you need a, a tablet. Um, it works on Android and Apple, um, but all you do is at the bottom of the paper, as you can see there, we've got um, on the left hand side some little symbols. What you've got there is record, 
pause um, and stop. And then on the other side, what we've got is we've got bookmark and we can tag it where we can write a little bit of inf information in. So there's little things that we can do um, while we're actually commanding the, uh, the uh, recording of the audio while we're in the meeting. So quite a common thing that's recommended for people who go into a lot of meetings, they may, may have dyslexia, memory issues, struggling with meetings um, and getting the notes down, but this is going to do all that for them and bring it out with them for later working. So it really, really enhances uh, meeting attendance. Okay, so the next product um, is called MindView. Um, I'm going to actually pop out and quickly show you MindView. It shouldn't crash because it's not sound. Um, so, but basically, MindView is mind mapping software. And the idea of the product is that we can um, organise our day, we can organise a project, we can even organise a report. And um, we're doing it in visual form. So we're getting in little bits of information in a visual form. And then once that's in there, we can then convert it. So as you can see in this image here, um, we've got basically revenue forecast with a little paperclip. Um, the paperclip means that there are other documents linked to that. So I could actually link um, a document from um, somebody that sent me a report. I've got a link in there and refer to it. It could be a presentation. It could be an audio file. It could even be a video. And I can link as many as I want to one of those icons uh, or as many icons as I wish. Additionally, as you can see at the bottom, we've got a load of writing. So as we click on those items, we then put the information behind it in the bottom. So it's like a little word processor as part of the product. What I can do then is actually export this to either a PowerPoint presentation or I can export it to Microsoft Word. I can even export it to Excel. Um, but the idea of the export then is the image comes with it, but then it will break it down and in clockwise order, each of the sections are put in your document. So each one of those will be a title, a subtitle, and then your information that you've got behind it. It also brings over any web links that you've got in there, any audio files, or anything like that. So you can create a presentation in minutes, um, where you'd, you know, you'd know, often spend a long, long time doing that. So I'll quickly pop out and show you um, a live version of it. So in here is where I log in and get the um, full version. As you see with this first login screen, um, I've got the option. So when I get the license, I get a PC version, I get an Apple Mac version, and I get the online version. All of them interact with each other, but they've all got different um, you know, options that they can do. So you can't use Excel with the Mac version, but you can with the PC. Um, you can't do Gantt charts and timelines with the online version as you can with the PC and the Mac. So it's limited as you get along to the um, online version. But if you save a map in the online version, it can open in the others. So this is great for somebody working at home and then at work. So they're doing the you know the dual working. Um, they might have a Mac at home and they might have a PC at work, or they might want, want to use the online version. So I'm going to quickly show you the online version just to show you what it can do. So we can quickly make a mind map. So we can do a standard mind map, spider kind of graph. Um, we can do a left map or a right, or we can do the top down, looks like a family tree kind of version. Um, we can actually then, if we want to, just go into um, ones that have been pre-created for us. So we're in business, so we'll go into there. Um, we'll actually look at, say, we'll do a project management one. Um, project planning, and I'm going to just open up a quick one in here. Let's go with this one here, uh, project management. <clears throat> so this is a template already created for me, and there's thousands of these online. Um, so you can really, really get your own templates going. Um, but also, you can create your own template. So if you're always going to be project managing and you're always going to fill in these different fields with different departments, those kind of things, you can get that all done, save it as your own template, and that's what you need every time you're doing a project. It's really, really flexible and useful. And as I mentioned earlier on, we've got a paper click on, on this one. So if we click on the paper, paper clip and we've got purpose there, it will actually go through that document and open it. OK, I'm not actually going to show that document because I'll have to come out and go back in. Um, but that's the idea of how we um, keep those within there. Um, what we can also do, so say I struggle with all that information uh, that I'm looking at, I can actually click on one of the sections and say what I want to do is branch focus. Now I'm only working on that section. So my mind, which was panic because I've got all that other information to fill in on that project, I've now gone down to one section, one arm of that project, I can concentrate on this and not worry about the rest. Get all the information in there and then come back out of branch focus 
and look at the full map again when I'm ready. And then I know I've completed that, move on to the next and branch focus it again. So it's a really, really quick, powerful tool where we can manipulate around, but concentrate on what we need to and visually. And visual is the big key thing with this because we're getting a visual representation of what will be our document that we're going to produce or our presentation or our project plan. Um, so that's the idea behind MindView, quite a powerful um, product that's been um, recommended to people with dyslexia, um, ADHD, those kind of um, neurodiverse conditions. OK, so we'll go back to the presentation, guys. That should be the last flicking in and out now. <clears throat> OK, so um, other uh, reasonable adjustment uh, recommendations could be ergonomic, so not all hidden conditions might be neurodiverse. So I just wanted to mention that um, a standard DSE assessment, so desktop screen environment assessment, doesn't always give solutions for people who have a physical condition. It could be you've got a bad back, you know, you, you could have other um, kind of issues. Um, <clears throat> so there are a lot of solutions out there if you have a more advanced assessment. So often recommending a workplace advanced um, ergo assessment is the thing to go with. Um, as we can see with the lady there, she's got a sit stand desk. And what that means is if she sits down in a position for so long, I mean, even now you'll feel uncomfortable in your seat unless it's the bare, most comfortable one. Um, you'll start to feel a little bit and start moving around. And all you're doing is trying to get the blood flowing through your body. If you then stand up and go in a different position, you can work for longer because that blood's now flowing. And then once you've got tired with your legs, you can sit back down and you're extending your working time um, and it reduces any issues that you might get. Other products there could be simply recommended. Um, ergonomic mice could be uh, recommended because the minute you use a normal mouse, you're straining across your wrist. Um, everybody can uh, do that and feel the strain. And then you're trying to move around. It could be a shoulder issue. So maybe you need a ball rather than a mouse. Um, and then in the ergonomic keyboard, again, if you actually use a normal keyboard, we're straining on our wrist on the insides by doing that, and we're working like that all day long. If you actually go into an external one where it's stretched out like the one on the picture, um, we take away the risk of RSI, but anybody who has issues, then you're taking away that pain that they're going to gain by using it in the wrong, you know, wrong position. Um, other things, simple things, could be just a seat pad that goes on your chair that's uncomfortable, and it gives you a bit of a, a, a support on the back of your, um, you know, under your lumbar support. Um, you can get ones that pump up as well, um, or just even a little pillow that fits under there can be a, a solution to make you able to work longer. Um, and then for people working from home, you can actually get rest um, pillows that you can actually sit up in bed with a particular pillow that helps you continue working while you're in a rested position. So you, your brain's not stopped just because you're aching, but you can go in that rested position and continue working. So there are other solutions um, for support with uh, ergonomics. Um, and then just other things in this one, that this slide is just uh, going into a little bit about different reasonable adjustments that might be recommended. So this could be um, somebody who is commuting to work, um, to and from work, might need taxis because um, they, you know, they may be visually impaired and they might need support getting in because they can't use standard um, means of getting into work. Um, fully funded by Access to Work, I'll go into Access to Work in a, um, in a moment. Um, so you can pay for that for the employee and then claim it back from Access to Work. Um, they want people to get into work, so they will fund it. Um, and that could be in between branches or just to meetings to see clients that can be funded. OK, so support is there and it could be somebody who's severely autistic and doesn't like you know, commuting in busy environments and that anxiety really, really gets them stressful. Then a taxi could be a solution because they don't have a member of family who can take them, those kind of things. Um, there's also um, a, a support called non-medical help and that is somebody who might support somebody in workplace. So I've got BSL interpreters, they actually fall under that. So you might need somebody who can sign for you. Um, but non-medical help could be somebody who needs support moving around in work. Um, maybe they need support going to the toilet even, or you know, getting them into meetings, um, moving around, uh, and just general kind of support. Um, so that's classed as non-medical help and is actually funded. <coughs> So um, assistive technology training. So I've mentioned assistive technology, shown you a little bit. Um, I've not actually scratched the surface with what I've shown you. And um, I always kind of come up with um, basically 
uh, a saying is if you put somebody who drives with a gear stick into an automatic car and then say, right, drive that car, they're going to start to say, I can't drive this. You know, you give me this smart tool, but I don't know what to do with it. And then when you give them a little bit of training, well, actually, if you put it in D, that's drive. You know, P's park, R's reverse, simple. But well, those simple instructions make that person enabled to be able to use that car. It's exactly the same with technology. You need to enable them by giving them the correct training. And it would be on the job training as well. So they'll actually train how to do, how to use the technology to achieve their tasks for the day. So they wouldn't be just shown this does this and this does this and everything that it does. If it's not relevant, there's no point in seeing it. It's more um, information that they need to actually do the job role and enable them. Okay. Um, coaching and uh, co-coaching mentioned this a little bit earlier on. Um, these are fully funded by Access to Work. The other uh, assistive technology and training isn't. Uh, it's partly funded. I'll go into the figures in a moment. Um, but if you've got somebody going through Access to Work, um, any coaching or awareness training for the team, which I mentioned earlier, that is fully funded. Um, I'll go into what all the ways you can get fully funding for employees as well in a moment. Uh, additional services um, that can be uh, kind of pass over, which we mentioned earlier about um, awareness being a key thing, is a manager awareness, so set training just for managers, so they're giving awareness of different disabilities more in depth than what we covered tonight. Um, or training on uh, neurodiversity consultancy, that kind of thing, are additional services that you can implement to kind of make changes in awareness. So a little bit on the funding, um, I won't go too in depth, I am going to share this presentation guys, um, but you can find this information on the government website if you look up access to work funding. Um, but basically the breakdown is if you've got 49 employees or less, you are 100% funded for your employee. If your employee is um, only with you within the first six weeks, it's 100% funding. So all of those solutions will be fully funded and you pay for it and claim it all back. Okay. Um, the key thing with the six weeks um, of employment is capture them, capture them at recruitment, get that awareness in. Let's let's do a bit of screening. Let's you know make them feel like they're welcome to you know disclose, and we'll put support in place because you're going to get that funding, and you might as well save money by doing that. Um, and then coaching and awareness um, would be fully funded. We mentioned that a moment ago, um, but it's also available for apprentices and Kickstarter scheme. So anybody on the Kickstarter scheme, which is a short period of time, that will be escalated. So Access to Work will actually push that through and run that through the system so that they get, get their um, support very, very quickly for that short period of time they might be with you. Um, so on the right hand side in the blue column is um, over um, 49 employees. The company pays um, £500 up to 249 employees. Uh, so it's the first £500 and then 20% of what's left. And then over 250, 250 upwards, you pay the first £1,000 and then 20% of what's left up to £10,000. Um, it's capped each year at £62,900. Now that is a lot of money and it's available as funding for each individual employee per year. So you can tap into this and get support for your employees and that you know that's, that's quite key. Um, saves you money but puts in lots and lots of support for the people. OK, so just a quick mention on what we do as our services. So a little plug for two health. Um, we basically uh, can do diagnostics, so we can actually do um, an actual uh, neurodiverse condition diagnostic. Um, so anybody who, who you think might be dyslexic, those kind of things, you do not need a diagnostic um, report for access to work funding. You only need to have a workplace needs assessment done. Um, they do not want, they, they don't require it. It's required in education for disabled students, but it isn't required for workplace. Um, so it's not always necessary and the company isn't basically required to pay for that. Um, we find that companies do because they want to ensure that they're covering them with the correct disability, um, but it's not a requirement on the company to pay for that. Um, we do help with screening, so we actually screen Scottish Police um, on recruits and um, we screen them to find if they need support, are they dyslexic, let's get that support in place before they go into the training as a recruit. That puts in all of that support <clears throat> and using read and write and then other solutions. They can't use Dragon there, so they came up with a different solution, which is how to write reports um, in a, a visual format. So lots of different ways you can get things put in place. Um, we also do the workplace needs assessment. 
um, and we're now doing a service we do where we do them free. Uh, so if you want further information, do get in touch. Uh, we do visual and hearing impaired assessments as well. Um, I'm hearing impaired or we're hearing aids. So there is um, a product out there called the Roger Pen. And basically the pen sends the hearing, but it's hearing in the microphone in the pen straight to my hearing aids. So I can connect that pen to a telephone or to a, a computer and that goes straight to my hearing aids and makes meetings much, much easier. So there are solutions for those. Um, and we do the ergonomic assessments that I mentioned earlier. Um, running through the rest of it is what we do after those solutions. So we do the training, we do the coaching, we do the awareness training, management coaching and disability impact awareness. Um, disability impact awareness is a little bit different. That's for somebody who's found out they've got a disability and it's affecting them uh, emotionally, uh, you know, mentally, and it's a bit of a shock. So uh, that can sometimes be recommended and we can support people with that. Um, and then at the very bottom is all of the supply. So we actually supply all of the Ergo kit. We supply assistive technology. Um, we give full technical, technical support. So if you're being recommended particular products, we'll technical support that and we'll talk to your IT department, make sure it works for you on your systems. Sometimes certain software can't be used, such as the Dragon in the Scottish Police. Um, and then we support end-to-end -end funded applications. So um, we'll help somebody um, they'll get a workplace needs assessment, we'll help them with their application for access to work and we'll guide them through what they're going to actually um, be receiving uh, at certain stages. We'll contact them, have you received this yet, chase them up and ensure that it's all running through and then make sure at the very end, after all the supports in place, that they were happy and it's all working for them. Um, and then a new service we're now doing is consultancy. So you can actually use us for um, advice on how to make your recruitment better for people with um, disabilities um, or how to make just your internal systems better, such as changing fonts on documents or you know, making it not black on white on the paper and changing the colours and loads of different things that we can consult with and help you with your internal systems and make you more um, disability aware and friendly. So that's it, guys. I've uh, finished. And I think I'm a little bit early, so I'm not too bad. Um, has anybody got any questions? There was one from Janet, David, about the funding issue. And um, what if it's a charity? OK, so that you're still allowed to get the uh, money. I think with the charity, you can claim the full funding um, back from Access to Work. So I'm pretty sure that you can get the full funding back. Yeah. Um, one thing to remember as well is um, you can look at the VAT relief as well. So often if um, you declare you're disabled, um, so if you do actually get um, the um, yeah, diagnosis and you've got an actual disability and you're getting product, you can get it VAT free because it's an, an, an enabling product. Um, only if the software, if its software is supplied with a computer though. Where it's other things like the Roger Pen and other things, you can get them VAT free. But if it's um, software on a computer supplied, that becomes an enabling product and you can get that back free. Wonderful. Libby, you've got a, a question. You're on mute, my dear. It's more of a comment that um, what something David said prompted me to think about. So in occupational health, sometimes we're doing these new starter questionnaires and it's made me think that maybe we need to change the way we ask about neurodiverse issues. So rather than just being a statement and a tick box, if it said something more like um, we would like to support you if you have dyslexia or whatever it might be, or we encourage all new starters to let us know, I think that might encourage a bit more openness. I think I think you're right there. I think I think wording it in a different way, so it's not a question. Have you got this? Disclose it now. It's it's a scary way to answer it. And I'll be honest, I didn't do that at two health. <laughs> uh, and then when I did actually disclose it later on, I got the support in place. Um, and yeah, I think I think doing that, you can get that in within the six weeks. So it benefits you. It benefits them. It's just putting them at ease that you're going to give them support. That's the key thing. I think that also comes down to. Um, the 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 company and the way that they sell these things doesn't it and uh, or the business or or you know the education provider or whatever mm -hmm. you know if it's just um a question uh, without uh, the reason for having that question there i.e you know to enable support to be given appropriately mm -hmm. it might seem a little bit off-putting i agree libby mm. 
I think I think even um, if it's an application form and people are filling them in and you're asking at that point, um, they're going to think, well, if I tick that, will I get the job? You know, um, so yeah, it's, it's putting them at ease that, you know, you, you champion that you want these people to come and work for you, you know, and then they'll feel better, really. Absolutely. Um, th there is some um, obviously quite a, a bit of assistive technology that is available on the high street now, though, isn't there? Uh, particularly, I'm thinking with iPads and the pencils and things like that. And, you know, there's a myriad of apps that work with that to, you know, to actually, yes, you can write, but it also will turn it directly into um, uh, type um, uh, with with a, a bridging app uh, directly to Word. So, you know, I think that there's lots of uh, assistive technology um, that we can use in everyday life as well and not just for business. Uh, but, you know, obviously, you know, uh, companies like like Two Health would probably, you know, tell the individual that for their everyday life um, if it wasn't going to be funded for, um, you know, for their for their business. But, you know, uh, yeah, don't um, don't automatically assume that, you know, that it, it isn't available uh, for everyday life because it is. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and mobiles now are becoming more and more um, kind of diverse for you know, offering support tools. Um, if you've got the latest Android, you can actually turn on a captioning. So when you're taking phone calls, it'll caption it for you and you can save that conversation. So if you're hearing impaired, you're getting a caption along with the telephone call. Right. And that, that's a part of the Android install. So, yeah, there's loads and loads of different solutions out there that can support people in everyday life as well as workplace. So, OK, wonderful. Thank you. Um, and then um, I think uh, there are no further questions at the moment. So um, if anybody's got any final questions, can you raise your hand or quickly type them into chat? Um, and if not, um, I'd like to offer my sincere thanks uh, to David um, and to uh, obviously to Health for giving us a, a really uh, a beneficial insight into ways in which we can um, support our um, neurodiverse uh, clients and patients. So thank you very much, David. And if you could all follow us on LinkedIn, we're trying to increase our LinkedIn um, follow. Uh, we do loads of free events um, where we're doing different you know, kinds of awareness. Um, so yeah, if you could follow us on LinkedIn, that'd be great. And you can find out what we're up to and, and the different things that we're doing within the industry. Um, so that'd be fantastic. And it'd be great to speak to people as well. So do follow me as well if you wish. Um, that'd be good. OK, thank you very much. Thanks for having me along. Thank you. I just, I just a quick one. I just we we are actually having an ADHD tr uh, coaching sessions internally via Two Health for one of our colleagues, um, and they've been absolutely amazing. And obviously, we're able to claim that back from uh, um, Access to Work as well. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, thank, thank you very you much. Everybody. Uh, thank you, everybody. Recording. Very much, David. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a good evening. Have a good evening.